Good morning, church. Welcome to worship and welcome to Wald Lake United Methodist Church. We are glad to have you here with us in worship this morning. A great day it is, a beautiful morning with blue skies and crisp temperatures. Fall is on the way, or fall is here. It's here. I had some donuts and cider this weekend, so I guess that means it's official. It's official. I am Reverend Kenny Walkup, and I'll lead you through worship this morning. Glad to be with you today here in this space. If you're a first-time visitor here in person or joining us and worshiping online, a special welcome to you, whether you're here or there, and glad you're with us this morning. And whether you're worshiping here in our sanctuary, whether you're going to watch later today or you're worshiping online, we want you to know that you're all valued parts of the ministries here at Wald Lake United Methodist Church. The mission of the 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 larger global United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We talked a lot about transformation last week, what that that means and looks like to be transformed in God's image. Then the idea that we take that transformation and put it into work to transform the world around us. Our vision more locally here in Wald Lake, showing compassion in our community by sharing the light and love of Christ. When you came in, you got one of our white uh, announcement sheets as well as one of our yellow connection cards. Please make sure and read through that white announcement sheet so you know what's happening in the life of the church. On the back, you'll find our prayer requests. Please make sure and read through those, and please add those prayers to your daily, weekly prayers, if you would, please. Our yellow connection cards, what we use to track our attendance and what we use to allow you to convey your prayer requests back to the church and to myself. So please make sure a note on the front of that card, uh, your attendance, jot your name down. If anything has changed, to make a note, new email, new phone, etc. But if you're here for the first time in person or joining us and worshiping online in person, please make sure and fill that yellow card out completely for us. We want to welcome you in the coming week. And if you're worshiping online, make a note in there of your, of your name so we can get a hold of you later in the week also. On the back of the card, you'll find the space for your prayer request. Now, here for those, those things you're celebrating, those joys in your life, jot those down. Those things that are on your heart that you want to, the prayer, you can jot those down also. But either way, please make a note. Check one of those two boxes at the bottom, whether it's for my prayers only, if I can share it later with our church at large during our prayer time. We are continuing our Learning to Love Our Enemies a worship series. Hope you're enjoying this series. It's a great way for us to anchor ourselves in, in God's love and God's mercy, God's grace, and understand what that means for us to, to share that with others. We'll continue that series today. And then there are a couple spots left for our work on Saturday, October 7th at uh, Mobility Worldwide. There's a sign-up sheet out in the parlor area. We will take uh, our group to uh, Milan and do a work day with them, helping to build those, uh, those mobility carts. So if you can join us for that, we'd love to have you with us that day. But I invite you now to, to bow and join me in a word of prayer. Today, just in awe of the many ways in which you show your love for us through the... Uh, smile of a friend, a handshake of a, another, the blue skies, the way the air feels crisp on a fall morning. Loving God, we ask that you continue to do a mighty work in each one of us, a work that continues to move us closer and closer to that image that you have for each one of us, that image of Jesus Christ. May that transformation in us continue until we are called home to be with you. Loving God, we pray all of this in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. My opening question for this morning looks like this. When is a time that you had a change of heart? Maybe something happened, influenced you, and Something clicked, and you had a change of heart and did something a little bit different than before. I invite you to think about that as we now make ourselves available to the Holy Spirit. And let us begin our morning worship service.
Please stand in body or spirit for the call to worship. Come, now is the time for worship. We come to worship God who provides. When the Israelites wandered in the wilderness, God provided manna and quail. God provides in unexpected ways. Jesus tells us the story of vineyard workers, some who work all day and some who work mere hours. Yet the generous landowner paid all of them equally. God does provide in unexpected ways, yet manna, quail, and grapes need gathering and harvesting. We respond to God's provision by gathering and harvesting all that God provides. Come, now is the time to worship. We come to worship in heart with God who provides for the long haul. Now let's greet each all. Now let's greet each other with the love of Christ. Opening him. For a children's message, come on up, guys. Leave the sword back there. Hi. How are you guys? One, two, three. Hi. 
Have you guys been fishing before? You caught nothing. Have you seen a fish? Yes. No. Me Ever? Me. No. Me. Me. Never in my whole life. Okay. I'm going to show you a fish. This is the biggest fish. What's that? Oh, the fish. You have a fish tank. Oh, yeah. You have a fish tank. You have two fish. I'm going to show you the biggest fish I have ever seen. Okay. That I've ever seen. Have you ever been to Indian River? And on the corner, it, it, there's, a, there's what? A, a giant sturgeon, right? Yeah. Not really a real fish, though, is it? Not a real fish. Although I've caught one about as big as that fin right there. <laughs> Not really. Not really. But today we're going to talk about a big, a big fish in, in church. And this looks like your Bible, doesn't it? Looks like your Bible. Yeah, it does. So I'm going to tell you a story about Jonah, this guy here. That's not his actual picture, but that's, you know, Jonah. And, and it says, Jonah and the big fish. It says, one day God told Jonah to go to the big city of Nineveh and tell him, stop doing bad things. That's pretty simple, isn't it? But he didn't listen. He didn't listen. And he ran away and he jumped on a boat, and the boat took him away far away from the city he was supposed to go. But God was unhappy. So God brought this storm, and the boat started to rock, and everybody got scared. And Jonah says, this is all my fault, so throw me into the water, and the seas will calm down. And there he is, see? There he is. And they threw, he threw him into the water, and all of a sudden the seas calmed down. But now Jonah's in the water, and God had to rescue Jonah. So you know what he did? He sent this big fish to swallow Jonah. It looks like a whale in this picture, doesn't it? And that's a clownfish right there. Yeah, I like Finding Nemo. So the big fish swallowed, and there's Jonah inside the big fish. There it is, with the crab sitting right next to his leg there. That's maybe, it could be his tongue. But Jonah needed to get back on dry land. So guess what the fish did? He spit him out. Go, go, <laughs> go like, <laughs> they all want to do it too. So you want them to do it? So good, go, <laughs> yeah, they all spit him out. And then guess what Jonah did? He went to the city and said, stop doing bad things. There he is, see, right there. Of course, the story is not really about a big fish. The story is about God forgiving the people in the city. We're going to learn about that today. So today, I want you to think about if there's somebody you should be forgiving today and who that might be, okay? And read your big fish story. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for stories that teach us about forgiving others. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys.
unable to break the seal and open the scroll. The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Sing and honor. Today's scripture reading comes from Jonah, 3.10 through 4.11. God saw what they were doing, that they had ceased their evil behavior. So God stopped planning to destroy them, and he didn't do it. But Jonah thought this was utterly wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Come on, Lord, wasn't this precisely my point when I was back in my own land? This is why I fled Tarshish earlier. I know that you are merciful and compassionate God, very patient, full of love, faithful love, and willing not to destroy. At this point, Lord, you may as well take my life from me because it would be better for me to die than to live. The Lord responded, is your anger a good thing? But Jonah went out to the city went out from the city and sat down east of the city. 
There he made himself a hut and sat under it in the shade to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord provided a shrub, and it grew up over Jonah, providing shade for his head and saving him from his misery. Jonah was very happy about the shrub. But God provided a worm the next day at dawn, and it attacked the shrub so that it died. Then as the sun rose, God provided a dry east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint. He begged that he might die, saying, it's better for me to die than to live. God said to Jonah, is your anger about the shrub a good thing? Jonah said, yes, my anger is good, even at the point of death. But the Lord said, you pitied the shrub for which you didn't work and which you didn't raise, and it grew a night and perished in a night. Yet for my, for my part, can I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Bob, for our reading uh, this morning. You know, there's a line that, that Bob read, and you all kind of chuckle when, when uh, Jonas says, uh, come on, Lord. <laughs> like, haven't we all been there, right? Come on, really? You know, I want to I tell you a story today, uh, a story uh, and kind of weave it in and out of this uh, text from Jonas. So, um, Hopefully it goes well. Neil Everett was a United Methodist pastor when a phone call changed the entire course of his life. And no, it wasn't about a, a, a reappointment somewhere else. You see, Neil was on his way to a Habitat for Humanity build. He had stopped at a, a restaurant along the way when a phone call came into the restaurant to see if Neil was there, which he was, and he was told to call home immediately that an emergency had, had come up. So Neil rose from his table. He goes to the phone on the wall. He dials, and his middle son, Wayne, answers Neil's call. And it is his son, Wayne, that tells his father that one of his other sons, a son named Scott, had been murdered. And the story goes that, that Scott had arrived back home at his apartment late in the evening after a heavy night of drinking, found that his apartment had been ransacked, obviously upset like any of us would be upon finding something like this. He begins banging on doors, neighboring apartments. And that is when he crossed paths with a man named Michael Carlucci. And the story of the encounter is complicated, as I read through an account in a newspaper. It says that, that Scott was allegedly waving a knife as he was banging on the doors, doing the same thing when he arrived at Michael's apartment. And in the end, something happened. Michael pulls out a gun and shoots and kills Scott. This is week three of our Learning to Love Our Enemies series. The title of this message is Mercy and God's Higher Calling. Would you please bow now and pray with me? Come Holy Spirit and fill the hearts of your faithful kindle in us the fire of your love. Loving God, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of our hearts, may they find favor in your sight, for you and you alone are our rock and our redeemer. It is in Jesus' name we come to you in prayer. Amen. You know, many scholars have debated this book of Jonah is Jonah truly a factual story 
Or is it some kind of a folk tale, even a parable told by God? Others have said that, that this book is, is satire, or even something else called midrash, Hebrew term midrash, which is a type of literature written to explain something else. Now, whether it is any of the above does not discount what it is, because the book of Jonah is the story of God's mercy. It is the story of one man's journey from true bitterness towards another to acceptance of God's forgiveness and mercy on another. In this case, that other is the ancient city of Nineveh and its people. If we go way, way, way back to the book of Genesis, we read about a, a person named Nimrod. He was a, a mighty hunter, and Nimrod is the one that founded this city of Nineveh. Now, in, in Zephaniah, in that prophet's book, chapter 2, the prophet condemns the city of Nineveh for its arrogance, and he foretells of the city's destruction that will come. In Nahum, another minor prophet, in Nahum chapter 3, the prophet Nahum called Nineveh, quote, the city of bloodshed. Sounds pleasant. Phyllis Tribal writes, writes in the New Interpreter's Bible commentary that, quote, the historical Nineveh was evil incarnate. It justly deserved its fate, end quote. Now, perhaps this is the exact attitude that, that Jonah has when God first calls out to him to go to the city of Nineveh. And in Jonah chapter 1, verse 2, God speaks to Jonah and says to him, quote, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come before me. Now, note God's words describing Nineveh, because God calls it the great city, not the wicked or condemned city, as others had called it, what Jonah presumably thought it to be. But Jonah had no intention at all, zero of complying to God's call. And verse 3 says that he chose to flee from the Lord. Whatever his reasons were, Jonah does not want the Ninevite people to be spared. He desires their punishment and probably thinks on some level that they need or deserve or should be punished. I began to stop and think for a moment about Jonah's reaction to God's call in his life to not want to do or to not do what God has called him to do, and I came to the realization that his response is not unique. Can you think of others who have been called by God in the Bible and said, no, you got the wrong guy? I think of Moses. In Exodus, according to Moses, uh, it says, quote, Moses shrank from speaking to Pharaoh, not me. In 1 Kings, we see Elijah, who, quote, fled from renouncing the regime of Ahab. In Jeremiah chapter 1, Jeremiah, quote, recoiled from prophesying to the nations, Many times, our own reactions to God's call on us to do something are not much different than those we have just seen on the slide. To run from God, to say to God, you got the wrong guy, you got the wrong gal, I'm not the one you're thinking of. Pastor Everett was nearly destroyed by the events that was 
that surrounded his son Scott's murder. The events themselves even ended the rocky marriage he was already in. And he was full of anger and full of resentment on that day, that day that he went and attended the sentencing hearing of Michael for the death of his son, Scott. And that's when he heard something pretty amazing. That's when Michael stood up, faced the court, faced him, and apologized for killing his son, Scott. And on the anniversary of his son's death, Pastor Everett penned a letter. He wrote to Michael Carlucci, and in that letter, he forgave him of what he had done. What's amazing is that Michael Carlucci then wrote back to the past, to, the, to Neil, wrote back to Neil, asking if he could see the pastor in person. Would he please come to prison and visit him? Now, the last thing that Jonah wanted was to see the Ninevites. Did he want to see them? He saw no reason for God to forgive them, and he wanted to play no part, no part in that forgiveness. And again, I bet we've all been there at some time. The last thing we really want to do is to see someone who has hurt us, to see someone that's caused us great pain, and that, I believe, is understandable, relatable. But the kicker is, in in Jonah's case, the people of Nineveh themselves, they've not harmed him, they've not hurt him, they've not wronged him directly. And most likely, he probably didn't even know a single person who lived there. He only knew of, or at least had heard of, their wickedness. And in chapter 2 of Jonah, he laments that they, quote, clung to their worthless idols and had, quote, turned away from God's love for them. That made him angry. In spite of all the reasons why Pastor Everett should not go and visit him, Pastor Everett did go at Michael's request and spoke to him. And in spite of all the reasons not to be, Neil and Michael became friends. Very good friends. In fact, the pastor himself is the one who spoke in support of parole at Michael's parole hearing. And it was a few years after his release from prison that the pastor officiated the wedding of Michael and his girlfriend. If you Google their names, you will find multiple stories of their incredible journey together. This article on the screen is from the New York Times. The story, titled A Friendship Rooted in Tragedy Based on Forgiveness, was an incredible read, detailing all that the two men had been through together, their journey together. You know, the the book of Jonah begins with the prophet hearing God's word and, and then running from what he was being called to do. But in chapter 3, quote, God's word came to Jonah a second time. And this time, God's word told him to go and deliver, quote, the proclamation that I am commanding you. God commands Jonah in chapter 3 to go and deliver a message. What we see here is God not willing to give up on the people of, quote, the great city, as he called it, or God unwilling to give 
up on Jonah himself, there was still a lesson for both Jonah and the Ninevites to learn. The lesson that God does not give up on those that God loves. And for that alone, we should all be sitting on our seats praising God. We should all be saying uh, amen to that fact. <clears throat> the second time that God calls here in chapter 3, Jonah complies this time. Perhaps it was the whole thing of being rescued from the belly of this great fish that changed his mind. If you're not familiar with that reference or the story I told the children, go back. Read the book of Jonah. Your fun fact for today is it won't take long. It's only 48 verses long. You can probably catch it during a timeout for the Lions game today. To truly understand the headlines in that article I shared with you, you need to understand and know the tragedy that these two men had lived through together. You have to understand the backstory. And that same kind of backstory is needed to, to know why Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. Right? There's a reason why he says, I'm not going there. And here's the piece you need to know to kind of put yourself in Jonah's sandals. The Ninevites were Assyrians. In fact, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Now, if you were here a few weeks back, I, I talked about the Assyrians, the northern southern kingdom and how they attacked and destroyed, right? The Assyrians were enemies of the Jewish people. Jonah going to Nineveh, and preaching was like him going into enemy territory, if you will, or at least the territory of those that his people disliked a great deal. As I sat there in my office this week, I, I, I had this parallel come to mind of the story here, and I drew a parallel to Jonah and Nineveh like Jesus and the woman at the well. Because Jonah going to Nineveh is kind of like Jesus going through Samaria. In both cases, it is people going where you would not expect them to go. But when they do, God does exactly what you would expect God to do. God shows mercy. God forgives. God heals. Earlier, I called Jonah a prophet. But until this time in this book, there is no prophetic message attributed to him. He becomes the prophet or he becomes the, the, the teacher or the, the messenger, if you will, when he complies to God's directive in chapter 3. It is then that he goes to Nineveh and he tells them that, quote, just 40 days more, and Nineveh will be overthrown. God was prepared to deal with their wickedness. Another example here of God punishing when punishment was fair and just and warranted. And, warranted. and we touched on that a little bit last week. Now, Nineveh was not Nazareth, not some itty-bitty tiny town in the middle of nowhere. Nineveh was a large town. The text itself tells us that it was a three-day walk across the city. Now, Jonah does exactly as instructed this time, and he heads out into the city, and he begins to preach to them just as God told him to do, the destruction that surely awaited them if they did not repent, turn from their wicked ways. And here is the amazing thing. Here's the thing you need to know. Jonah was good because Jonah was successful. The text says that the people believed God after Jonah's proclamation. 
It says they began to fast. They began to put on mourning cloths, sackcloths, you see other places. The people of Nineveh did exactly, exactly what every good preacher, and the bad ones, desire. The people heard his message, and they complied immediately. And you would think that would make Jonah happy, right? I mean, if I preached it and you did it, I'd be ecstatic. Even the leaders of the city took part. The king issued a decree immediately to all people, call upon God forcefully. And God saw the good that had come from Jonah's message and decided against destroying the city and the people. You know, crisis avoided, the city is spared, and everyone should be happy. From the king that issues the decree to the peasant sitting in ashes in the street, from God that calls Jonah to go and preach to Jonah himself. All should be happy. But you know, as Bob read to us in, in chapter 4, verse 1, quote, but Jonah thought this was utterly wrong, and he became angry. He questions God, but not about God's compassion or mercy. Jonah expected that because he knows what kind of God God is. In fact, Jonah was so upset that he says to God, quote, you may as well take my life from me because it would be better for me to die than to live, end quote, because you spared Nineveh. The thought that the Ninevite people would actually repent from their evil ways, turn from their evil ways, and that God would provide a way out, that God would provide salvation to those people was so painful for Jonah that he cries out to God that it would be better for him to be dead. There is also a, a hint here, an underlying hint that on some level, Jonah knew he would be successful. He knew he would be successful when he went to Nineveh, and that is why he fled from God. Because he did not want salvation to be granted to those people the people of Nineveh, and he did not want that salvation to be his doing. There is a narrative that follows what I've just told you. Bob read the bulk of it to us. Jonah goes outside the city. He sits down, builds a hut, and God provides this shade tree, shrub, bush, whatever it was. We're not really sure to protect him from the sun. This is the second time, if you're paying attention to the story, the second time that God intervenes in Jonah's life to protect Jonah. We had the big fish. We had the little shrub. You know, if you go back and read the story, you learn that Jonah was in that fish for three days and three nights. It is interesting to note here that Jonah was filled with joy when God's mercy was shown to him, the whale, the shrub. When God's mercy was shown to him, he was happy, right? One commentary I read this past week summed it up like this. Jonah, quote, Jonah himself called on the mercy of God and enjoyed the mercy of God when it was extended to to him, to him. 
but yet he resents that same mercy, that same compassion, that same love when it's shown to his enemies. There was still a lesson, still a lesson for God to teach Jonah, or better put, a lesson still yet for Jonah to learn. That lesson applies to today, by the way, for all of us. It would be good for each one of us to wrap our head around this lesson, the one that Jonah is learning in a painful way. That same commentary I referenced a moment ago said it so well that I want to share that author's words because they summed it up better than I think I could. Quote, the lesson is clear. Not only does God's concern for people go beyond Israel, beyond where, where he is from, but he is totally justified in doing so. God is justified in showing mercy and compassion on whomever God decides to show mercy and compassion. The lesson of Jonah reminds us that God is, is the God of all people. You know, Pastor Everett, he had a a, a great change of heart. From anger and frustration when he sat there for that sentencing hearing to true mercy and forgiveness as him and Michael became friends. And while not recorded in the book of Jonah, not written in the book of Jonah, there is a Jewish tradition that says that in the end of the story, quote, Jonah fell on his face and said, govern your world according to the measure of mercy, as it is said, to the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness. If these words are true, captured in Jewish tradition, then in the end, Jonah begins to understand the the true extent of God's mercy, of God's compassion. We talked about transformation last week. We can believe that Jonah was becoming transformed by this ordeal he has been through the fish, the shrub, Nineveh's acceptance of the salvation, grace, and mercy offered by God. So here's my hope for each of you. Remember, you do this, I'll be really happy. It is my hope that we will all learn to do the same thing. Show that level of compassion and mercy and that it might affect us the exact same way as it affected Jonah. Let us pray. Loving God, all praise and glory to you this day. We thank you for this story of Neil and Michael, Scott, the story of Jonah, the people unnamed in Nineveh. We thank you for the examples of mercy and compassion you have given us, examples that we can use to allow to to govern our lives, may we learn, may we put into practice what we have heard here today. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite our ushers and now to receive this morning's offering. If you're here today for the first time visiting with us, please know that this service is our gift to you and nothing is expected from you in return except to enjoy your time with us in worship.
number of prayer requests have come in this morning. I want to share those with you at this time. Larry Beal asked for prayers for cousin uh, Fran Sturgis being treated for skin cancer. Bonnie asked for prayers for Tom's cousin Ken who was hospitalized, coughing uh, up blood, waiting for test results. Bonnie's cousin, cousin going through uh, medical treatments. Continue prayers for, for them, please. Also, Peggy Hawk asked for continued prayers for the Winnicky family. We've been praying for them for a while. Walt has entered into hospice care. Alex Ross starting physical therapy on her knee. Surgery coming October 16th. Continue prayers for Devin Ross as she continues to improve and have less pain. For Christy Ross having minor surgery this Friday. For Jessica McLean having a heart cath on Wednesday. There's so much in our midst that need prayer. For the family of Bob Taylor, Paula Taylor's uncle, who passed away this week, prayers of praise. I'm going to say prayers of praise for Alex Miller, who put in her notice at her job on Friday. Prayers of, yeah. Okay, prayers of praise, confirmed. <laughs> I invite you not to bow to pray with me. You indeed are a God of, of endless patience. We know what pleases your ears is our praise and not our complaining. There are times that we whine, but we do know that in the end you desire relationship with us, and that relationship comes with the good and the bad that we bring to you. May the offering of, that we have brought today be an act of our praise. May our offering today find ways to bring comfort to your children. Loving God, we continue our prayers for our missionary, Helen Roberts Evans, for those engaged in missions around the world. May the stories of hope Love, compassion, mercy of a good and gracious God be spread far and wide. We pray for the Josiah F. Yancey Church in Liberia, for their pastor, Reverend Solomon and Reverend Hezekiah. We pray for our country. We pray for our church. We continue to pray for those who are in positions of leadership over others, that they lead from a place that brings honor and glory to you. We pray all this the way that Jesus taught his disciples to pray as they gather together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand for our closing song?
after our service, there'll be a time of fellowship out in the parlor. Please join us there if you'd like. Sunday school begins at 1045. Go now in the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and may you be filled this day by the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen.